budget. Okay. And this is focused primarily on property tax levy increases. It's not overall budget increases. It's just well, how the changes in all those obligations are forecasted out for the budget. We do a very, we being the city as a whole, do a very thoughtful five-year financial projection every year as a part of the budget process. That's the reason you see some of the blue in early years a little higher um, and then a little lower from year to year. That, that budget increase right now is anticipated to affect the levy, the levy in the 36 to 3.9% range over the next several years. The green is added on on top, and that is related to just the street and park program. Uh, <clears throat> that number in the first year is a 1% increase. That's related primarily to the $3 million of park operating that is a part of this program, and a little bit of uh, funding for the street operating as well, that 800000 of street operating. After that, the increases average about 06 to 0.7%. Okay, that's not 6 and 7%, that's 0.6 and 0.7%. So if you add those two together, the overall impact, and, and Council Member Gordon's point, um, that green spike really for the effect on average taxpayers is going to be the same as uh, the following years. It's going to be around 33 to 3.5% for inflation on existing uh, budget, and then about 0.6.7% for this new program. So the total annual increase we anticipate in the levy on a long-term basis is in that 4.1, 4.2% annual increase every year. Okay. Excuse me, Council Member Bender has a question. If you would go back to your previous slide, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up on Council Member Gordon's questions and some of the discussion we had at Ways and Means, um, it's my understanding that the TIF district will be decertified no matter what in that year, absent legislative action. And so we are taking some of that funding and committing it to parks and streets. Um, and it doesn't change the fact that we'll have to figure out how to pay for any NCR or neighborhood related functions that we want to continue past that year where that funding was part of that TIF district. Um, but, but we're really not changing the trajectory of this TIF district, which was already plan to be decertified in that year. I just want to make sure that that was correct and noted. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Bender, you are correct. Um, if we wanted to continue funding city programs and utilize all of the benefit of that TIF district, then the spike on this would go from just under 6% to closer to 7.5%. So it's unfortunate that when a city passes a budget that the focus is on levy increase rather than net impact on taxpayers, right? And so that, that's the dilemma that everyone will face in four or five years. Councilmember Gordon has a question. So it maybe it's more of a comment. I think that um, when our tax districts um, would naturally decertify in sunset in the past, we have sometimes gone to the legislature and say we would like to continue them. And I think there's a, I don't want us to t think we're tying the hands of the future council necessarily at this point in terms of is it all decertified or any of it or would there be hopes of extending any of it. Um, I might think it ought to be decertified myself right now today and that we should pay for the NCR and the neighborhood revitalization purposes out of the general fund to find another way to do it. But I, I don't think we're committing ourselves or a future council to doing that in 2020. We could go to the legislature and say, we want to decertify half of this and we want to keep half of it going or something like that. So there's there's options. But Council Member Bender is right in the normal course of events, the way they're set now, it would be set to decertify anyway. So I'm not arguing that. All right. Thank you. This next chart is simply taking a percentage increase and putting it into real dollars. Uh, so for example, in year one, uh, where we would have anticipated a property tax levy increase of right around $12 million, we are now anticipating a property tax levy increase for 2017, which obviously will be evaluated in the budget process this summer and fall of just under $15 million. And you can see the, the spike, and then as bonds are paid off over later years, we actually saw a little bit of decrease, but obviously we can't predict what's gonna happen in 20 years with any 100% uh, accuracy. It's important to note what's not included in this funding plan. We're not counting on new construction 
Clearly, new buildings are going up in the city. There's going to be a benefit that taxpayers are going to realize. It's not deferred growth like a TIF district. It's real growth in today's, uh, in today's world. Uh, but the impact of that, we just didn't think was reliable for long-term uh, source of funding for this program. But it will, it will be an indirect source. It will benefit all taxpayers, and it will help with the budget process. That's about a 1% to 2% increase in tax base, which will then again, lower the overall impact of the 2017 budget. We are not counting on any reserves, especially there's no development fund reserves, there's no park reserves, there's no public works reserves. We see all of those for important capital needs over the long term. Um, we are not using the, the funding that we anticipate from the state, uh, $3.4 million in November of 2016. We are not using those for anything other than what the purpose we understand that legislation to be, which is to pay debt service on the bonds that were issued for the downtown library and other neighborhood libraries. Uh, and we're going to use those monies to pay off those bonds as soon as possible. But it's likely we're not going to be able to pay those bonds off for at least seven years, maybe eight years. And it seemed outside the time frame of dedication of uh, this particular program. The implications really then is what's a new current service level. Instead of a 3.3, 3.5% increase for the long term, we're going to look at a 4.5% one 4.2 percent increase to maintain current service levels so these road and park improvements just become a part of what we assume to be basic services for the city and that's again a reflection of the commitment i think that's behind this ordinance um, but we will still although we will still have the annual evaluation of mixer revenues and it's not just about if you read the ordinance you may think it's focused just on the levy itself but there are all components here how much debt's issued versus how much cash is issued will also be part of the changes on the, on the uh, annual basis. And we will update then, the, as is intended in this ordinance, those projections to make sure that this program is sustainable. I would also just say that um, you know, we, as a finance department, are comfortable with this program. We don't think that it stresses the city resources. Um, but there are certainly trade-offs, um, as there is with any budget decision whether short-term or long-term, and we will certainly be looking forward to working with the mayor and the council and, and um, this future budget uh, process that does assume this as a baseline, and we'll take the action should you move forward today as that statement from the city council. Thank you, Mr. Ruck. We have a question from Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. You did this in your colorful graphic. But I wondered if you might take us through the appendix. I'm not sure if you're planning to do this anyway, but the um, this chart. And I just, I think it would be helpful to hear the levy increases that are anticipated in order to support this plan. And I think it's important to understand that if the council doesn't support these levy increases, that will mean cutting funding for other things. Um. Madam Chair, Councilmember Bender, I think the line that you're referring to is in the second box in the appendix, and it is the second to the last uh, line item in that box. It's titled Total Annual New Property Taxes for Parks and Street. Uh, so in 2017, that is $3.3 .3 million. Um, and then it increases, so this is not what is necessary every year to be added to the budget, it is the cumulative amount then that's going to be in the budget line item for this program. So um, the annual increases uh, you know, are also listed in this chart. They are on the box, the third box, it's the fourth line down if I'm looking correctly, which starts out at 3.3 and then drops down to $2 million up to $2.3 million again, in that $2.3 million range. And then in 2021, we see a $9.498 million increase. So I just want to show the difference between those line items, one being annual increases to the budget, the other being the cumulative money that's dedicated to this resource. That answers your question. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are joined by Park Superintendent Jane Miller, as well as several commissioners. I no, uh, uh, Park Board President uh, Walensky is is here uh, somewhere. I know she was getting a little air. It's it's warm in here. Uh, we also have uh, commissioners uh, Tab Reland and Forney. And if there may be uh, 
and Stephanie Musich. Um, I know that there are others who would like to be here, but um, Park Board Commissioners uh, usually have a day job, uh, and they are doing this work in their um, off time. And thank you. And we also have State Representative Ray Dean, who has joined us. Um, we are going uh, to open the public hearing, um, and I just want to again say that I know that uh, Council President uh, has some uh, amendment proposals that uh, she is going to make. There, I think, may be other council members who also have some language suggestions, so I don't know what all will be proposed. I want to just say to the Park Board, we're going to invite you, not just during the public hearing, uh, but throughout the presentation, if there are things that the Park Board would like to see, we, we're going to certainly make sure you have an opportunity to have dialogue with us as we are having a discussion of the proposed ordinance uh, here. Uh, Council President, did you feel like you wanted to give any high signs of any things, or should we take the public testimony and then we can go through some more details? Because I think we're about to get into the weeds of ordinance language and... Uh, Why don't we take public testimony? Okay, and we'll thank that. you. Uh, all right, so um, I do have uh, a lineup uh, here, and if you would like to speak and haven't yet had an opportunity to sign up, you may do so over by the, the clerk. And we will take testimony until everyone who wishes to speak has had an opportunity. Um, and this is the continuation of a public hearing. And after we conclude today, we will close the public hearing. Um, so the first uh, three speakers are Meg Forney, then Sheldon Maines, then Car Carol Becker. And we do have a clock to the side. I will also help you with keeping on time. We're asking you to keep to two minutes or less if you are able, so we can uh, do our best to get through everyone who's here today. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Lydon. Uh, my name is Meg Forney. I am a Minneapolis Park Board Commissioner. I live at 3201 Zenith Avenue South. My, my, but the devil is in the details. Um, at 9.45, when I did sign up for the public testimony and everything, I was opposed to the actions that you were about to um, take on. Um, at this point in time, an hour later, more than that, um, I am wholeheartedly um, in support of your substitute ordinance. Um, I am very appreciative of the words of um, the 20 year plan being included, the adjustments for inflation, and our definition of neighborhood parks. I also wanna thank um, our park staff who have done their due diligence this past year in vetting our neighborhood park needs. And I really, I, I'm, whatever. <laughs> I'm very, very happy and thankful for your responsive support of our neighborhood plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Maines. Uh, Chairperson Glidden, members of the, the council, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Sheldon Maines. Uh, I live at 2718 East 24th Street. A little bit about me, I live across the street from Matthews Park. I live two blocks from the second largest affordable housing complex in the state of Minnesota, and I serve on the board of directors of that complex. Um, I live on a street that is concrete and was built in 1960. I think it was one of the first concrete streets, and you have to remember, concrete streets cannot have a mill and overlay. It slows traffic down a lot. Um, find my notes here. A um, few years ago, I served for a couple of years on the Board of Investment and Taxation with uh, Council Member Johnson, and I learned a lot. Uh, city finances are, are not simple or easy. Uh, city finances, finances is not fun. Um, you can never get everything you want, and Minneapolis city government is really, really complex. Um, I'm here to uh, speak in support of Council Member Johnson's amendment. I think it goes a long way to what we need for, for the park board. I think it goes a long way to addressing the fact that yes, they are two separate government entities, the city council and park board. Um, I commend you and the, and the park board for reaching an agreement. I know those things are not easy. Neighborhood parks are what make Minneapolis great. Uh, neighborhood par parks are especially important to my neighbors who are low income and African American. That is a resource that they depend on. 
So I just want to thank you for all your hard work and just reaffirm that I support uh, Johnson's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Maines. Ms. Becker, if you could come forward, then we have uh, Brad Pass and then Casey uh, Kielzik and then Mike Tate. And if folks want to start getting themselves prepared in line, I will say I have two sheets of testifiers um, and I anticipate that we may have more. Um, Carol Becker, 3201 48th Avenue South. Uh, and I'm also on the board of estimate. Um, I'm really excited about this. I mean, I've been working on this almost two and a half years now, and to have a historic agreement between the city and the park board, it has never really happened. And I am so excited. And Barb, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. You have been stellar. Uh, Councilor Goodman, you also, you guys have been doing yeoman's work. Thank you to the staff, uh, the finance staff, the park board staff. This is an exciting, exciting day, and I look forward to this being approved. And by both bodies and uh, moving forward on fixing our parks. Thank you. Mr. Pass. Please come forward. Then Casey Hi, I'm, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm Brad Pass. Uh, I live uh, in East Phillips and uh, I have something I'd like you to see. Uh, may I pass Hand it? Hand it to the clerk, please, and then they will, uh, the clerk will pass it to us. Thank you, sir. I live in East Phillips, 2536 18th Avenue South, to be exact. I've been there since 1967. And that was uh, before uh, we had a park building in East Phillips Park. They used to call it Cockroach Park. Um, we, I think that for inner city people, parks, local parks are absolutely essential. Uh, I mean, after a livable wage job, Food on the table and health insurance, I think the parks are the next, next most important thing. Uh, they provide socialization for, for people. They provide, in many cases, even food for people. They provide a safe place for our youth and for our families. I think that uh, funding the parks, the local parks, the neighborhood parks, is probably the most important thing you can do. Um, we can't let ourselves fall into the situation of St. Paul, where they've cut, had to close down parks. That's not acceptable. We're better than that. We can figure this out. I am sorry that uh, we weren't able to hear from uh, 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 Superintendent Miller and some of the other people from the park board. I think uh, we will be able to do that after the public hearing. Well, I think it would have been important to have that okay. before because Thank you. then we can respond and see what they think about what's happening here. Okay. But I, I don't know about the amendments. I don't know about uh, some, of the, some of the nuances. What I do know is the importance of keeping the parks funded and not funded so at such a low level that the park board has to, has to raise the user fees to the inner city people. Thank you, Mr. Pass. So anything you can do, do it. Thank you, sir. Casey. Then Mike Tate. Then uh, Margaret Berry. Hi, my name is Casey. I'm at 2701 South 8th Street. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the council members uh, as well as uh, the park board, the Citizens Campaign, and really everybody who showed up today and has partaken in this conversation about neighborhood parks to make this a long-term uh, sustainable plan that promotes a healthy park system as well as racial and economic equity throughout the entire city. And so I know uh, there has been a robust conversation on all those fronts uh, by all council members and really everybody in this room. So I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. I wanted to speak in favor of this plan uh, as well as the uh, Johnson Amendment that was added onto it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tate, then Margaret Berry, then Alexis Penny, then Carlos uh, Rodrigo. Uh, thank you, Councilmember, President, and to the to the committee. What a wonderful job! Uh, it's uh, 40 years or 40 decades for me. I live at 4326 Logan Avenue North, and I've been in the park system for uh, 40 years. And uh, to see this two boards come together and and come up with an, an ordinance or an amendment, uh, and Barb uh, can't thank you enough. I think we spoke a couple times, and you said. Uh, some could happen and uh, the team worked together and uh, so proud of you and uh, we'll leave the legacy going forward uh, for young people uh, when we come together as a group. So uh, I commend you, I thank you, I support this fully and uh, 
I will continue to give my service as a volunteer coach and try to raise others to coach behind me as I go forward uh, with your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Is there a Margaret? Okay, then Alexis Penny. Good morning, I'm Margaret Berg. I'm with the League of Women Voters. I've been co-chair of the Parks Committee for the last two years. I've been, uh, I'm at 2112 Newton Avenue South, moved there in 1968. Um, I've watched, we the, as the League of Women Voters have watched parks. We had a big study back in 1985. And the things that we looked at at that time was all about how the park board was operating, how things were not particularly transparent, didn't have a lot of public input. I think that those things we have seen so improved, and I'm sure that's been helped a lot by the internet and uh, ability to get information out. But we are so, we know so much after looking at some of the deficiencies in our neighborhood parks, why we need to support this. And so I really urge you to support the um, amendment that I understand Barbara Johnson will be in, in uh, introducing in a few minutes. I think the 20 years is really necessary to make sure that this is adhered to, this plan. And um, I just thank Council Member Goodman, my Council Member, and Barbara Johnson for getting this going. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Penny. And after that, Carlos Rodrigo, and then uh, Tiffany Flynn uh, Forsland. Good morning, help. Good morning, council members. They Alexis both Penny. Work, I think. <laughs> Which one? This one. They both work. I okay, think. great. They're both picking you up. Phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, Alexis Penny, twenty four thirty Logan Avenue North. Um, so I guess when I first heard about this park plan, I was kind of excited about it in the sense that like it makes sense. We have deteriorating parks. I want to make sure that like th those things are addressed. I guess the reason why I was skeptical is because I felt like for a long time we had not really been at, uh, putting adequate resources into our parks. And then I had wondered if we were gonna put the money somewhere, where would the money go? And so I started having a conversation with folks along the campaign, uh, folks that are elected officials, folks that are just in my neighborhood. And I started realizing that um, while we had a real opportunity here to just, to just do the right thing, we also had a real opportunity to make sure that the racial equity focused lens was a part of this conversation and not dropped out of the conversation. Um, I definitely appreciate my uh, former council member, Barb Johnson, and Council President Johnson, uh, in our work to make sure that this plan moved forward and we had something that was significant. Um, and I definitely appreciate the work that was played by people at the park board and the citizen lobbyist group. I'm glad I could be here uh, to be part of this movement. But for the most part, I just want to make sure that people realize that when we do go forward with this, um, and we have all these nuances that you're probably gonna bring to us so that we can better understand how the money will be allocated, that um, that we do appreciate it, but we're still gonna be watching to see how things tr trickle down in terms of like um, neighborhood, neighborhood par not just neighborhood parks, but our neighborhood associations and that how that funding um, goes on in 2020 and 2021. But more so, I guess we're just gonna be really focused on that this thing delivers tangible benefits to our community members, um, whoever they are. Thank you, sir. Carlos Rodrigo, then mm -hmm. Tiffany Flynn Forsland, and then uh, Jorge, I think it's Vargas. Carlos Ingrid from the Weeder community. I just want to quick show this, if you see here, equity in this. And this is basically what the park board represents today in all the departments. I don't see any equity in there, senores. Um, I don't want to support this unless all the issues are being, are being dealt with. We, they're looking for money, but they don't know how to, they do a lot of waste of money. For, for instance, there was an equity from the equity training from Latinos. I was supposed to, I was working with them. They decided to, to hire an African-American friend of Cordell, one of the person that works there. This person hired someone else. They never paid that. There was no accountability in this. So they have a lot of issues and they don't care. Another issue with that is Michelle, the person that is in the equity and inclusion department, she's the one that's talking about equity here. She is the one that micromanaged. I was doing a PowerPoint in Spanish. She never wanted me to present that. And she was correcting my Spanish, which she's not even qualified. She's not even native. So she's the one that's talking about equity here, senores. And then the other one, Larry Hemphrey. 
He will use kids from the Minneapolis public school to translate the business, doing business. I tell them, I send a letter to all the commissioners. They didn't do anything. You know what they did? They promoted him. So this is the kind of things that should be there first. And then we could talk about funding. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tiffany Flynn Forsland. I don't see, okay. And then uh, if, if folks want to get ready, uh, Jorge, I think it's Vargas, then DJ Fortas. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, I, I didn't know I was speaking. Um, but I guess the biggest piece is um, our position is to delay um, funding at this time. Um, we, we do want more money in the park system. Um, we do think that's extremely important. However, with um, the current structures in place, it is not inclusive. It isn't accountable to um, everyone. And so that's why we're really, our stance is to delay the funding at this time until there are better structures in place. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Jorge Vargas, then DJ Fortas, then uh, Shelly uh, Stoney. How's it going? First yes, of all, sir. I would like to thank everyone that came and supported us with the signs. Um, as Tiffany says, we are looking for more accountability. We uh, simply cannot support them as of right now. We cannot support the parks right now as uh, the reason, the main reason would be if we do, we'll be allowing them, we'll be opening the door for them to keep these practices which, we, which are documented, which we have perceived and which our people have perceived. Thank you. Okay, sir. Uh, DJ Fortas, Shelly uh, Stoney, uh, Tom uh, Evers. Hi, my name is DJ Forbes. Thank I you. also have bad handwriting, so that might be why it's Fortas. Right. I can't um, see anyway. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a resident of Ward 8. I live at 3929 10th Avenue South, and uh, I strongly believe that our neighborhood parks are the jewel of our city. <clears throat> I passionately support a sustainable increase in the funding necessary to ensure that our park system remains viable, and I strongly urge you all to support the ordinance with the Johnson Amendment moving forward. Thank you all for your service. Thank you, sir. Shelly uh, Stoney, Stoner. Tom Evers, and then Stephanie Musich. My name is Shelly Stoner. I grew up on the east side of Lake Harriet. I didn't grow up there. I raised my family there for 25 years. I live downtown now. And um, I realize this is a very fluid situation, and I might be jumping in uh, into the flow a little um, not as knowledgeable as to where things are at. But And I usually am not here when uh, in support of tax increases, but I am today. Uh, I'm very passionate about, about our neighborhood parks. I think parks and our neighborhood parks are made up of families. I have my visual aids. There she is, student at Columbia University Med School right now. And this, uh, believe it or not, is the proudest thing my husband has uh, down at his office amongst all his other trophies for top uh, financial management. Uh, he was the manager of the Southway Southwest Lakers in 2002. <laughs> and the reason I brought those things is because I do believe that Families make up these park, these neighborhoods. Individuals such as these make up families. And the process that we went through of going park to park all around the neighborhood to play sports, to have our kids involved, to have my husband coached, coach and meet other coaches from other neighborhoods <laughs> took us out of the east side of Lake Harriet. And it brought others in. And we learned a lot about other people and about other communities. I'm a better person. I know my husband is. And um, I, I believe that the neighborhood par neighborhoods are about people. Roads are important. Uh, but we can all bitch and moan about the roads. But if you don't have a destination, which is the parks, it doesn't matter. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry, I lost my track here. Tom Evers, Stephanie Musich. 
Chair Glidham, uh, President Johnson, Council Members, my name is Tom Evers. I'm the Executive Director of the Minneapolis Parks Foundation, also a resident of the Standish neighborhood at 3736 21st Avenue South. Um, I'm here to speak in support of this uh, measure as I understand it. It is very important and it's also very um, inspiring to see the Park Board and the city come together to understand that the parks are integral to our city's health and future. They represent our economic, environmental, civic, and cultural health. They are also a place that employ youth throughout the city and create opportunities unlike any other institution in this city. So I am inspired by this and excited, and as a representative of the philanthropic community, I believe that this agreement will inspire greater philanthropy throughout the city. So we will build on it and grow with that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Musich, and then <coughs> Anthony Kelly, then uh, Liz Walensky, Tony uh, Sterley. Good morning, Minneapolis City Council. My name is Stephanie Musich. I live at 5665 Woodlawn Boulevard, and I represent the 5th Park District here in the city. And I just wanted to come this morning, and despite the phone calls some of you may have received from me or voicemails saying how upset I was at the redlined uh, substitute ordinance that was out on the website, um, I understand that the issues that I had with that have been corrected in the new substitute ordinance that uh, Council Member President Johnson will be bringing to you. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you for recognizing how important parks are to our communities on the south side where I represent and the north side where I used to live. Um, these, these parks are the fabric of our community. They're what bring us together and give us places to play together. And I cannot thank you enough for helping us to move our equity um, mission forward by investing more in communities that have not seen investments um, at the level that we intend to put into them in the past, in the future. So thank you so very much for your help in uh, making that a reality for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony Kelly, then uh, Park Board President Liz Walensky, then Tony Sterley. Chair, Council Members, thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Kelly. I'm the Field Representative for City Employees 363. We have over 150 uh, employees at the uh, Minneapolis Park Board and over 400 here at the City of Minneapolis and Public Works. I would like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and speak strongly in support of, uh, of this amendment. Uh, our employees trim the trees, we mow the grass, we take care of the streets, we take care of Minneapolis's water as well as the sanitary sewer, both sides. Uh, the best way to support these employees is to support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, President Walensky, then Tony Sterley, then Dennis Wilson, and then uh, Abdurman Mukhtar. Uh, Chair Glidden, council members, thank you for having us here today. I would really like to thank everyone for their hard work on this. Um, it has been actually a, a pleasant experience working with all of you. I mean, there's been our ups and downs, but we're a large group of people on both sides with lots of opinions. And so it does take some time to come to an agreement like this. I'm very supportive of the amendment that I know that Council President Johnson is going to um, introduce. I'd like to thank my council member, Kevin Reich, for allowing us to speed along his timeline on the roads piece to make it so that we could get our work done and bring him along as well. I know that going fast sometimes is difficult in government. Um, I'm sure many of you had the opportunity to see the equity piece that we rolled out for this park money. Um, the first list that came out, I'm sure everybody looked at where their neighborhood park was, because I know I did. And um, this is the first preliminary list. Um, I immediately spotted Northeast Ice Arena on there, which in my district is an enterprise item, so it had to be pulled from the list. So the rest of you got to move up a place. Um, so we are working on that. We are working on lots of things with equity at the city, uh, particularly doing work with um, GAR, GAR, which is... Um, the Alliance for Racial Equity. I have more homework to do for our third training. I hope you all received the letter this morning with our response to the 415 letter from Community Justice Project at the U of St. Thomas, led by Nikima Levy Pounds. We hope you realize, and we know this is an ongoing process to which we at the MPRB have been dedicating many of our resources since the end of 2011. This is when the Betty Webb report came out and Superintendent Miller has been working on this since practically her first day on the job. We truly have a treasure in her as you have a treasure in Mr. Ruff. We are so glad they are both helping us out on this project. 
Again, we appreciate all the work that you're doing. We hope you are very happy with the list as you see it come out, knowing that over 20 years we will be able to identify and rectify the needs in almost all of our parks. Thank you again for all of your assistance. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Walensky. Tony? Thank you, uh, Council Member Glidden. Uh, I actually just want to start by echoing something you said earlier uh, in the meeting, which is that this really is a historic opportunity for the city. Um, and I want to say that I support it, uh, and in particular that I support uh, Council President Johnson's uh, amendment that I understand is going to be introduced later today. Uh, and I believe if we pass an agreement that provides sustainable, uh, adequate funding to our neighborhood parks in a way that promotes racial and economic equity in the city, that it will be a huge victory uh, and that it will leave a legacy for the next generation of Minneapolis residents. Uh, this is really government at its best, I think. Uh, you know, we've all come together, we've identified a problem with our parks and with our streets, and we've come up with a solution to solve it. And I wanna thank all of you for uh, participating in that and helping to drive that solution forward. Um, I also just briefly wanna say that I uh, actually really appreciate the folks uh, who came here today to address uh, some of the HR pieces. Um, you know, I appreciate it because they obviously care about the community, they care about their government, so do I. Uh, so does uh, the Save Our Minneapolis Park Citizen Group. Um, but I do wanna just reemphasize that, again, we all know this, but this money is going to maintain our neighborhood parks. Uh, it will benefit the tens of thousands of Minneapolis kids who use them every single year. And because of uh, some of the equity provisions that have been put in by Council Member Cano and others, uh, it will help kids in our underserved neighborhoods. Uh, and that's incredibly important. So please vote yes today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have two last people signed up, Dennis uh, Wilson and Abdirman uh, Mukhtar. I don't know if others would like to speak, but you are certainly invited to. And if you would like to, please sign up. It looks like there may be a few more people who have signed up. Thank hello, you, sir. Hello, committee, and I mean, counselor to you all. Why well, just up here to speak on I think you should just delay the funding as a Minneapolis resident. I want more racial and equity in, in its practice, you know, so I just want to be shown what's fair, put it like that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mukhtar, if there are other names, I'll take them too. Okay. My name is Abdul Mukhtar, um, 72326 Avenue South. I'm a Minneapolis resident, um, father of um, four boys. And I made a decision to raise my family and kids in Minneapolis. I'm a youth worker by profession, and I started my youth work uh, through the Minneapolis Back and Rec Youth Line. Um, the closest park or uh, Minneapolis Park to the City Hall is Elliott Park, and that's where I started my youth work. But I work at the Bryan Coyle Center, and I live in City Riverside neighborhood. So I really, um, so support any investment that can sustain our parks, that can sustain for my kids. But I also want to make sure that as leaders, as elected officials, we also really emphasize some of the neighborhoods, some of the parks have been neglected for a long time. Um, there's a lot of um, funding gap, and the residents who live in those neighborhoods are not organized or they cannot come in front of you to advocate it themselves. Um, they are not able to attend all the meetings where these plannings are happening. So I really encourage um, your decisions to support how we can sustain this, um, your leadership. But at the end of the day, I wanna make sure that that one Minneapolis, that number one park system in the US can be number one park system for all of us, all of our residents all of our neighborhoods. We cannot choose some big specific neighborhoods and parks. And unless we address that, unless we really honestly uh, address that equity, then we'll just continue uh, to have this conversation. But any funding that can sustain the park system, um, I, I fully support that. And but my goal is really to make sure that we address the funding gap. It's not actually funding gap, it's an opportunity gap for my kids and the thousands of kids that live in the neighborhood that I grew up. Thank you. Jeff? 
John Herman, uh, Liz Pitts Cartwright, Maria Pittner, if you want to start coming up, please. Any of those people who are here who intended to speak? Did no one from that list of three? Uh, I will keep calling names. Renee Wilson, Susie Brown. Good morning, council members. My name is Susie Brown. I'm the public policy director for the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And we have 21 member, 2,100 members statewide, but more than a quarter of them are here in the city of Minneapolis. My comment is really narrow, um, and it's related to the non-property tax revenue stormwater fee. And I really, frankly, need to do some follow-up with the city attorney and her colleague from the finance department who presented this. But we have concerns in general with the use of municipal fees that are charged against property tax exempt properties and then used for um, city things that would otherwise be paid for with property taxes. So I need to learn more about the specifics of what will be, um, how this will be constructed and what it will be used for, but we generally have concerns about proposals like this that um, capture revenue that would typically be through property taxes through a fee that affects exempt nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you. George Kuzak. Then Anita Tab, and I will go back over the list. Madam Chair, members of the council, my name is George Puzak. I live at 1780 Gerard Avenue, South Minneapolis. Thank you. Please support the substitute ordinance with the council president Johnson amendment. What do Wyzetta, White Bear, Edina, and Roseville have in common? They all have private country clubs. We, the people of Minneapolis, have the neighborhood parks, otherwise known as the People's Country Club. Neighborhood parks are the social, emotional, and recreational touchstones of our community. Neighborhood parks are equity in action. They offer opportunities for people of all ages, backgrounds, and cultures to meet, greet, and exercise. Please support the substitute amendment and the Johnson Amendment. Uh, uh, amendment. Please support the ordinance and the Johnson Amendment. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Tab is next. I'm just going to read through the names because there were quite a few who didn't come up and you may not have intended to testify when you signed in. John Herman, Liz Pitts Cartwright, Maria Pittner, and Renee Wilson. And after mm -hmm. Commissioner Tab, I have Craig Wilson, Nakima Levy Pounds, and uh, Adriana Cerillo. Thank you, Chair Glidden, and um, thanks to the council members. I just want to assure you that this is really all about equity. And I just want to give you a little glimpse into our world with an example. During the summer, I have a couple of rec centers in my district, one in an affluent area, another not in an affluent area. One has air conditioning, one doesn't have air conditioning. We have to close down the one that doesn't have air conditioning when we have really hot days. Why does the one in the part of town that's more affluent have air conditioning? Because those people actually paid out of their pocket to put it in. I don't want us to have a two-tiered system. And I think that allowing us to have this extra money really is allowing us to focus on having a one-tiered system throughout our city for everybody. So I think this is really a very, very important, um, uh, it, it, this is something really important that we wanted to be able to do for our city and for everybody in our city. So again, I just want to give thanks to um, President Johnson and Council Member Goodman for stepping forward and really kind of taking the horns on this. I know it's been kind of a tough battle, but um, I look forward. I think it's a pretty historic sort of thing that we're working on here. And um, thank you. I hope you will all support the, the new amendment that's coming forward. And um, we look forward to working together on this. Thanks. Thank you. Craig Wilson, then Nakima Levy-Pounds, and Adriana Cerillo. Thank you, Council Member Glidden, and thank you to the rest of the Council uh, for hopefully supporting this and uh, under the conditions of the Johnson Amendment. Um, I'm going to give you a little personal narrative as to why I'm here today. I moved here in 1986. I'm native Hawaiian. 
I came from Hawaii and I was born in Colorado. And I, when I came to the city, my family first toured the regional park system. They moved to a first string suburb. And I'd never seen anything like it, even in this be these beautiful places that I came from, Hawaii and Colorado. I'd never seen infrastructure like this. It looked like a huge salad to me. You know, in all honesty, I thought I had arrived to the city of salads. <laughs> um, and, and it really stuck with me. When, after I graduated from high school, I left for many years. I traveled around the world, kind of figuring things out in my life. I came back to Minneapolis because of the system, uh, like, like many of us here in this room today. Um, I eventually became a community organizer 20 years ago. I worked for the Longfellow Community Council, and I saw how these neighborhood parks in the Longfellow community really impacted kids' lives and families' lives. And a lot of these very um, challenged situations where kids didn't have anywhere else to go after school but the rec center to play ball, to do things um, with, with others in the safe space. And that's why I'm here today, because I really believe in neighborhood parks. I've seen it firsthand. I believed in it so much, I became a landscape architect and urban planner, and now I'm a sustainability consultant trying to help green things that make economic sense. So I feel like Minneapolis parks have fundamentally, fundamentally ch changed me, and I think they fundamentally changed the, the course of the city. Um, and so for that reason, I want to thank you for supporting this, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Malibu Town. Good morning. I'm here um, as a law professor from the University of St. Thomas and also the president of the Minneapolis NAACP to express my concerns about a number of issues that have been happening with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Now, I know that in this city, unfortunately, we sometimes go along with business as usual. And it's much more convenient to do that when funding requests come forward, especially with an institution that has been known as one of the top parks and recreation boards in the country, or one of the top systems in the country. The problem, however, is by focusing on a title, we forget about the people who work for the parks and recreation system, particularly people of color, who through our investigation we have seen have, have suffered discrimination and racism at the hands of those who are leading the park board system. This is completely unacceptable in a city that claims to be progressive and liberal. And I know that as people came forward a couple of weeks ago and raised these concerns, a big part of the response was, you know, well, that's unfortunate that that's happening, but there's nothing that we can do. And what we're saying is that there is something that you can do. We're tired of living in a tale of two cities. That's the, the best if you're white and the worst if you're black. People of color who work for the park board system should be treated equally based on the work that they perform, not based on the color of their skin. However, they face disparate treatment in terms of being disciplined. They're not being promoted. Or, or retained in an equitable manner in comparison to their white counterparts. We do not have a place for a Jim Crow system in the city of Minneapolis, but that's exactly what's happening. So we're asking that you delay the funding of the park board until they get their acts together. They've known about this for over 15 years. There have been studies that have been conducted that show that there are significant problems within the park board system. We're also concerned about the inequitable distribution of resources amongst the different parks and recreation centers. I live near F Farview Park, and I can tell you that it is not nearly as nice as some of the parks in Southwest and other more affluent parts of the city. That has to change. So yes, there's a need for funding, but it needs to be distributed equitably. And if people are going to sign up to work for the park board, they need to be treated with dignity and respect. And that's something that I would hope that this city council can get behind and not allow the park board to continue to get away with discriminatory treatment towards people of color. Thank you. Thank you. We have, we have, we have one more speaker. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hello, council. My name is Cynthia Wilson. Okay, you're I am Cynthia a, Wilson. Cynthia Renee Wilson, yes. Yes, ma'am. I am a current employee of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. I had an opportunity to speak to Councilman uh, 
Long, and um, I spoke to several other people. Uh, I totally agree with what's been said by um, Nakima Levy Pounds, and that there is a lot of discrimination, racism, desperate treatment. Um, I'm one of those people who receive that. Uh, I am here not as a disgruntled employee because I appreciate uh, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the work that I do there. I've been working there since 1988 where I interned and received a, a full-time job. 